Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Michelle Muniar. I am the Associate Dean at the College. Uh, my role today is just to welcome you uh, to this wonderful, uh, actually, week. And I know that uh, the students and the faculty and our distinguished guests, plenty, have been working very hard uh, all day. We are very proud of this tradition and of the Department of Landscape Architecture. I think uh, they have started this tradition of Design Week. Uh, I think that uh, uh, you have actually taken something that is incredibly important to all of us that live here. And certainly, uh, I would count myself, and I know uh, most of us, at least most of you, may be here for temporary uh, basis, but we are here for long term, so we're very, very appreciative of you taking our Alp or taking our Mediterranean and taking the most wonderful and important feature of our landscape uh, as your uh, study subject and treating it in a very, very uh, uh, thoughtful and, and serious way. I think that uh, uh, there are several folks from the community that are here, and I know that they're going to come all through the week. So I think this is a very important thing, and I know that uh, the community will take your work uh, very seriously uh, because as a community, uh, we are looking at renewing ourselves and making sure that we are a great place to live, uh, work, and play. So for that, I thank you so much. And again, on behalf of the College of Architecture and Planning, I welcome everyone here uh, and uh, look forward to a fantastic uh, design week. With that, I would like to, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jody Rosenblatt, Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture. Jordan. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody this evening, members of the community, members of the college, students, faculty. Um, I am just delighted with what we were able to accomplish today in such a short amount of time. I can't believe how much progress is going on in the studios, and I know we have um, a long, uh, long week ahead of us, so get a deep breath and, uh, <laughs> you know, lots of coffee and so forth. It's, um, it's wonderful to see you here, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to introduce Pliny uh, this evening. I know some of you who've been here all day um, know a little bit about Pliny already, but for the benefit of those who are just coming in tonight and certainly for those friends who are webcasting in from all over the world, um, let me just say a few words about Pliny. Uh, Pliny Fisk. He is the co-director of the Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems. Uh, this is a nonprofit in Austin, Texas. I used to have a terrible time with that until I realized that I could just say the acronym CMPBS and that would guide me through it. Um, but the Center for Maximum Potential uh, talks about the human spirit and talks about the communities that we live in and the way to take them to their fullest um, through thoughtful and often very provocative design. Pliny uh, went to the University of Pennsylvania. He has been involved in projects around the world, um, teaching and lecturing and designing for uh, clients uh, from Dubai to Seattle, um, and bringing a lot of the wisdom that he collects along the way uh, to an expression that would really only be appropriate to call transdisciplinary. He finds intersections of form and place that um, are really outside of any one particular discipline. And he fearlessly becomes uh, an anthropologist, a biologist, a chemist, an architect, a dancer. Uh, I've, I've seen that one. Uh, and um, many, other, many other hats as well. So without any more, let me introduce uh, tonight's lecture, which is 35 Years of Commotion, a brief history of uh, the Center for CMPBS <laughs> and Plenty Fisk. <laughs> Thank you.
in more, well, more ways than one. To get the energy level going again, you guys really do it, don't you? So this is the third round for the day. And there's some people that have come back for more. It's unbelievable. So I'm going to slant this evening a little bit more towards the architecture end, but it's very difficult for me to divorce the land as part of what I do in architecture. So they will merge. But I'm first going to mention a couple of stories. Some of you have heard lots of stories today. I've got more, a couple more to tell. So a friend recently mentioned a series of events that I knew nothing about that is fairly profound. And that is the fact that during the Berlin Wall crisis, the world had a feeling that something was about to happen, but weren't quite sure when or how. And so they brought together all sorts of experts worldwide, political scientists, systems thinkers, politicians, sociologists, I think there was a mathematician in there for statistical correlation of things to figure out when the wall was going to come down because that was a fairly major event to the world and that part of the world and so on. So there were about, I think, 22, 23 people. So 10 of them were fairly positive that it was going to be probably 10 years. About five or six said, well, they think four or five years. There were only, I think, two that said, <clears throat> I think it's going to be about two. The meeting was over. And how long did it take? Six months. So that sort of reminds me of lots of things going on. When you get this high quality of people from all over the world, and the consensus is way off and that things are happening much, much faster than we ever tend to think that they're happening. We're sort of in this somewhat constant state of denial. So I was reminded of this when I was asked by a Texas foundation, it's a well-known foundation, the Meadows Foundation, to be one of six or seven critiquers of their 2020 strategic plan. And in fact, there have been a sort of a series of these things happening over the last few years. So I've advised the MacArthur Foundation as to who gets MacArthur's from the design professions. I've been advising the Gates Foundation. I'm a grant reviewer for the Gates Foundation. And so I've learned to sort of be a little bit outspoken because it doesn't seem as though anybody, even with the quality of somebody like the Gates Foundation, who is very far ahead, is there. And so when the Meadows Foundation asked this, I said, you know, I looked at your prospectus, I looked at what you're going to be funding, and I said, you know, I feel as though it's about the same period of time when I started in Texas and you first funded me that you're asking exactly the same questions. And so I went off and began to do a very strange thing. We started looking at disasters, FEMA statistics, 
and began to realize that Texas was number one in all disasters of any state in the country and billions of dollars were being lost almost yearly. And there was almost no admittance in anything that I was reading. And it was sort of, to be very frank with you, la la land. Sure there were social programs, sure there were this, sure there were that, all very critical. But the actual real critical stuff, and I started mapping. And I mapped this stuff in a true McCartian fashion. I started overlaying disasters to the point I began to realize that some parts of the state are in real serious trouble. The most flood area in the country, not the southwest, not the south, the country, is north of me by 50 to 100 miles. The forest fires beginning to happen in Texas, I was beginning to see at the end of my driveway, I look west, whole sky on fire. Look to the east, 34,000 acres gone. Simultaneously happened in a situation that no one had ever connected to the fact that maybe we should change the way we build. Maybe should we should change where we build and not keep losing the extraordinary money that we're, money, that we're losing. So I recently got back to them and I said, you know, you incorporated it into your plan? Oh yeah. How about you fund us to think about this a little bit further and to propose a new atlas of what the state's about. Not that atlas that you funded me to do 30 years ago, <clears throat> which in fact was almost irrelevant. Let's do it at a new level. What do you mean? Well, here's what I mean. I spelled it out. So, second story. So, I'm on a delegation in the Soviet Union. We were chosen to do this because we represented a change situation in the United States, which was really beginning to understand resources, energy, all kinds of things in a fairly fundamentally different way, and that we all had organizations doing work in that area. So we were exposed to all sorts of things <coughs> all the way up in the government circles. Times had changed. The direction had changed. Entrepreneurs were coming out of the walls saying, what does this mean? But the really cool thing that happened So they were sort of mimicking who we were, but they had a phenomenal way among this group, of course, making toasts. And the better the toast you made, the more they liked you. And of course, that was after six, six vodkas. So they break down all the inhibitions, and they believe that the truth would really come out. So being a little guy, six vodkas, I would be under the table. So I learned very quickly that, you know, vodka looks like water. And between my legs underneath that table, I had my little water thing. And I kept filling it up when no one was looking and putting that thing on the table and drinking away. And they said, man, this guy is cool. He's one of us. So what I was really doing was stalling to figure out how could I possibly 
get a toast going anywhere within the realm of these toasts that were being given. And they had artists, they had philosophers, they had ballet dancers on their team, they had all these phenomenally creative people. And a lot of it was beginning to be bullshit. You know, we respect you and we do this and it's so nice for you to be here and maybe someday we can do something together and hugging and kissing and after the toast and on and on. I said, you know, <clears throat> I'm going to give a, <clears throat> a toast, but I'm going to give a toast to the difference between our cultures. And I can bullshit too. So I said, you know, you're like the deep, long-lasting forest, trees with deep roots, deep culture. You've been through tremendous amounts of change. You're still here. And here you have the guts to get this group of Americans that basically represent a bunch of weeds. Any crazy idea that comes along, let's go. Get the money, more creative the idea, more money you can get, and away we float. So I said, you know, the funny thing is that if I looked at this as an ecosystem, I looked at that field, I looked at the forest, any ecosystem, the maximum productivity and creativity happens where? On the edge. So you having us here, looking at that edge, looking at the new world the way it might be, here's <clears throat> a toast to the edge. They never forgot this toast. And it's sort of very, very akin to what's going on in this so-called sustainability movement. Because everything that I learn is never within a, any given discipline. It's always on the edge between disciplines. So one of the best things that happened to me as a student at Penn was that I mixed things up. I went through McCarg's program, took the bus up with Lou Kong, worked for McCarg. My wife worked for Lou Kong. I went over to the business school. I got very involved with system sciences, with a person that I didn't even realize was one of the best in the country. Sat on that class illegally, because I wasn't part of Wharton. Every time the Russell Acoff would say, hey, I know some of you are not supposed to be here. Would you kindly leave? And I'd sort of shrink into the corner and hide. But what began to happen <clears throat> was very important stuff that I never would have gotten in architecture, never would have gotten in landscape architecture, regional science, urban design, any of the planning programs in the department that I was in. So this egg situation I've perpetuated as far as I can possibly perpetuate it. So tonight I'm going to, as I mentioned, go a little bit more towards the architecture end because I've spent so much time with the other department that somehow you guys have not quite merged. And by the way, McCarg, as John will attest, purposely got lots of studios together that would cross-fertilize. So we bring in, bring in Ralph Knowles from California, who was an architect, doing very interesting land stuff within the landscape department and the architects together. That high-level thinking. So that was a real model for me to begin to think about what would the future be about.
So this presentation goes to a version that we fairly recently developed that says, unlike many of my friends, they have tried to take their whole world, no matter what is they're confronting, and they squeeze it through their one way of operating. It's biomimicry, it's cradle to cradle, it's a uh, Dymaxian world. It's many, many ways of saying, I have to put something through something that I know, instead of taking the attitude, you know, there are lots of different situations out there. And if I, for one moment, as I've mentioned to my landscape friends for the last day, mixed up working with a revolutionary government and the Sandinistas in Nicaragua with what I'm doing with the city of Austin to create a green building program, one or the other would hang me, or both. So we've learned to actually take what our thinking process is and been brave enough to shift it. So I'm going to show you a few projects uh, that relate. So this is my lenses. So you can take these lenses and put them together in whatever sequence, focus, far, close, medium, and to begin to get some perspective from mixing things together in new ways slightly every single time that a project begins to come up. So all I have to do is do that. Unbelievable. So one of the things that even though we're very technical and very involved with data-driven kinds of things. We think that design is absolutely fundamental to what we do. Even to the point of how we think about icons, how we think about overlay, how we think about design from the aspect of actually categorizing what we're doing. So here are 11 lenses, and here are the various projects, and we always call our projects since we're in the business of producing something that has a viral possibility, a prototype, and that that prototype gets repeated. So this repetition says every step is pretty important. Things are something that says, you know, you are not an architecture office. You're not a landscape architecture office. You're not a planning office. You are a research educational office that is trying to send things to the next step. We have a fundamental respect for two things, nature and people. We never go all the way to say people are the important thing. We never go the other way, saying nature is driving everything. We say the two together are the driving force. And that that driving force begins to say, we are the managers. Whether we like it or not, we are the managers. And if we don't make it as managers, and understand nature, and respect it, and work with it, and actually propose things that nature might not be doing, we're not admitting where the world is going, which is human domination. Have we worked with a lot of those indigenous people? We've worked with at least nine tribal nations, both in this country and Central America, and learned a tremendous amount from how they operate. We even are proposing that when you folks design and re-look at the lenses that you're going to be doing for your projects, that we're actually going to borrow from how these people in that biome 
use the soils, the plants, the insects, the animals, the firing of certain woods to make all their ceramic glazes, and how the colors came out of that place to be used as the colors that we might be considering for how we operate here. <coughs> so every project <coughs> has this lens overlay. And the projects vary immensely. So context matters. Context says, you know, Austin, Texas is a very, very different thing than going to Lone Pine, California. So the advanced green builder demonstration actually connects about four or five different eco zones in Texas, which is very different than how we worked in the Baja, which is very different than South Texas, which is very different in many ways, but shares certain things with the hill country in Ingram, Texas. We also take a attitude that we live what we preach. Our offices, our entire place begins to be exactly what we're trying to say to others to do. In fact, recently that has gone and taken a big extreme turn. We've been funded to do some villages for island nations. We have outlandish things that we're trying. A new way of thinking about tents that evolve into the roofs of buildings. New ways of doing resources. New ways of doing solar kitchens. And what are we doing? We're taking those things and first building them at our place. The next thing we're doing, we're living them. At us. And some of these things become a little bit outrageous. I was in a lot of trouble with <clears throat> the uh, highway patrol in Texas for about two years. I was going from Austin to A&M. And I got, I believe, a total of three letters from the state saying, we're about to take your license away. You have too many speeding tickets. So having signed a multi-year contract and being a tenured faculty person, I said, you know, I have a terrible, itchy right foot. Maybe I should go and buy a plane. So sure enough, there's a land strip, landing strip sitting at the center. And I fly over those guys. I almost one day, you know, maybe we should take some water balloons and drop them, but I didn't go that far. I get better mileage, half again the speed, land in 350 feet, and now I get there, can get there in 45 minutes versus an hour of 100 miles per hour plus because I can cruise at 130 miles an hour and get better mileage than the VW diesel. So it's an interesting situation, living with what you're talking about. So this building is a very interesting mixture of things. Some of it's straw. We're in the tempered grassland. Some of it is fly ash cement. Some of it is a soil material. All that rebar is 98% recycled steel. It's crushed cars. Most things are sourced within a very sensible distance. But what we're also trying to do is to begin to have a place that is really a design icon. Because it would be one thing to get all this technology together and for this thing to be ugly. 
So this building has been published with some of the most respected buildings worldwide. Bill Bow. We might not deserve it, but it is interesting that the design professions have begun to accept a new aesthetics that begins to say sustainability is ingrained into what aesthetics is about. You walk up the center and you have wetlands around you. In other words, you have sewage. Sewage sits one foot from you as you walk up to the front door. Is there any smelling going on? No smelling. Are those crazy flowering plants treating the wastewater? Absolutely. Do we have to cut them? Yep. Why do we have to cut them? The roots get so dense that the wastewater doesn't go through. So we're actually forced to have fresh flowers in our building at all times. It's a very, very sad future. But the other thing going on is that it's evidence-based design. It's saying we did not do all those roofs to make some kind of church of the green movement. We did those roofs because we increased our surface area in order to collect the right amount of water at one third the amount of conservation that the city of Austin asks for with that amount of storage to actually make this thing work, to balance it. The sourcing, the use, the storage, the resourcing, all is sitting there. We also did a ridiculous thing, and I'm sorry I'm not going to have these slides now that I think of it. We did this very boring thing of putting it on an absolute grid. And all my design friends say, you know, that is about the most boring building that I'm ever going to imagine. I said, guys, it's worse than that. Every one of these columns, I'm connecting to a GIS system, and that's an equal area plat carré system. They said, what? You're doing a building related to GIS projections? Oh, it's worse than that. All the buildings are sitting there like this. So here you're beginning to develop a basis for communication. You're beginning to say, what is going on in that cell? Can I also design an exciting, interesting place? Can I design flexibility within this system? Can I pick this entire building up because it sits in an agricultural part of our city or our county? Could I move it? Do I have the right to actually design anything for a permanent use in agricultural land? So the city and the state and all the agencies, the five agencies says, you know, Fisk, you're going too far. You're going too far. And I said, but you funded it. But we didn't understand that. Say, so you want me to continue? Sure. There's this very thin line. Is it going to succeed? Do you get the publicity that is far beyond what they ever dreamt of and make them look much better than they ever dreamt of? So this game is a great game. And the building's plugged into place. It's plugged into the businesses. It's plugged into the resources of the region. It's supportive. Every major element in the building, I can spatially, with my area resources, what I call my point resources, the businesses connected to the areas that connect to the building. What is this? Is this landscape architecture? Is this planning? Is this architecture? None of those things. It's all of those things. Where does the straw come from? Is it actually helping the landscape? Is it an invasive species of grass that's coming in that I'm sequestering in the building? Am I using adobe because everybody in the green movement uses adobe? Nope. Because adobe is sandy loam. And sandy loam grows 
school. Do any of my Adobalero friends in New Mexico and Arizona admit this? Not a single one. I'm an Adobe guy. So I find other materials that I can complement and do good work that actually help the environment as I'm doing building. And in the process support good work, good businesses. So it's sort of a fractal of the business community that's worth supporting. Very conscious of scale, very conscious of where am I, how am I contributing at that scale, at that boundary, and how does it reflect to the next boundary, above me and below me. But I'm participating in a cluster, a sort of Russian doll experiment that says what I'm doing here clusters to the next, up and down. And I look at performance, and I even begin to say, I am designing with life cycle and the sourcing and the processing and the storage as I design. This isn't some afterthought. This is a new vocabulary that I work with constantly. And we have no fun just a very serious environment, that table rises. You know why it rises? To get out of the way because we have a hellacious party. It folds. It goes into the ceiling. Lots of the panels around the room fold down to desks. The desk folds out of the way so we can do what? I think it's called dancing. Jody mentioned dancing. So it's Austin, Texas, folks. You don't admit where you are culturally. You're not admitting a lot of stuff. So we are connected to the music places. We did all the greening of the <coughs> largest music festival in the country called ACL, Austin City Limits. Now, one of the magical things going on here is the people that I'm working with. So one of the wisest things I did when I was a young professor at the University of Texas is that I had my seminar teaching this stuff at noon. And the reason I did it at noon is that I could attract community people into that classroom illegally. They could not afford going and paying the fees for the University of Texas. I was very selfish in doing this <clears throat> because I was trying to mix the community with the university right in the classroom. And the projects we were doing in the community, the community, of course, knew much more about them than any student could ever Word about. And it just happened by a little bit of, what is it called, stroke of luck, that one of those students, with no credit, by the way, they weren't getting any credit for doing what they're doing, ended up doing, you know, better work than other people getting credit. So one of the people that did this was Gail Vittori. And Gail Vittori not only became my wife, it's a typical, you know, professor stealing the student, because she was really good, cute, all those other things. And then she began to catch on, went to open houses. <clears throat> trained herself to go and understand it. She was active in the community already. She became the translator, saying, you know something? 
that green building program possibility is real. We could do this. We could start the first green building program in the world. So she became a very important liaison with the city. And out of that began a whole movement related to green building in Austin that became viral to about 30 cities around the country. That became viral to the state. The state in Austin became viral to U.S. Green Building Council. We were in the original think tanks. And that's the way things happen. You sort of go from the home base on up. So here's another project, and I put this in here because you guys are doing a solar decathlon. So Texas A&M, with their entourage, came one day and said, you know, we'd like to attract you to A&M, buy you out of Austin, and in fact, we'd like to put a whole manufacturing facility together for you. Now you're talking. You mean I can spec an entire state-of-the-art manufacturing facility to go and experiment with manufacturing. I can actually do what I keep preaching to the world, design for manufacturing, the way all product designers know about should be bringing, be brought into the architecture, planning, landscape architecture community. So, San Antonio had just won a very important worldwide award for their acequias. Everybody knows what an acequia is? It's called the drainage system between all the old buildings, the forts, the churches, and everything that would keep San Antonio long time ago drained properly and getting the water into the fields. And they just borrowed a technique, or we borrowed, sorry, a technique that they had known for a hundred years that just became a international award with IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. So I said, cool. Let's do the draining system on our patio that would take all that water and put it into that pond and respect the fact that that city and that area got this award. But what is also going on here? What's also going on here is this is a totally new redo of FEMA trailers because the entire basis of that building is part of the tens of thousands of FEMA trailers stranded in fields across Mississippi, Louisiana, and we say, we're going to study those things, dissect them, look at this resource, because it's huge. And so, I'm not going to go through in this session how we did that, <coughs> but I'm going to go over it with the solar decathlon people when that time comes. So it's sort of an interesting combination. That garage, we may believe, is the garage of the future. Vehicle to, vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle, start up the engine, generate into the grid, get paid, have an intensive food system right as part of the building, have that bat tower sitting out there, because Austin is a little bit batty, and I come from Austin. begins to work with all the systems in such a way that everybody understood what was going on. So when a student comes up to me and says, you know, I haven't the faintest idea how this thing works. I say, great. You're the person that is going to go and code 
and understand so that everybody could understand how that building works. Because once we're on Washington Mall, chaos happens. And not only does chaos happen, but you have about 600 people watching you in the middle of chaos. So at least you've got to make believe that you know what you're doing. And the reason they, by the way, hired me is that Texas A&M, about three years earlier in 2002, was asked to leave the mall because they did not finish their building on time. It was a great scene. Manufacturing plant. Every one of these could tell a connected story about where the sourcing, where the processing, food comes, goes to the kitchen, or the dining, and all these things were all connected to each other as a whole little ecosystem of components for a building. And they could all be manufactured simultaneously. So there was a crew in charge of this and a crew in charge of that, crew in charge of the main core. And so we could go down and really seriously think about going into a business. Trained to go into a business. Just like my old student David Lake had done with Lake Flato in San Antonio, who are now in the business of producing green homes in a manufactured environment. So the main person that was doing this became their main person had a job before he even asked for the job. Because David came and said, we need that kind of experience. It's very evidence-based economics. It says, you know, where's your money go? This is a state university. Where does the common family's money go? I'm coming in from Mars, and I'm beginning to ask, what's the money? balance. Forget all this air balance, food balance, this balance, that balance. What is the balance of the family income? Most of it goes to the shoulder and to the land. We analyze that one bar and we began to realize, my goodness, most of the money is going where? To the bank. How do you reduce the amount of money going to the bank? You start small. You pay off. You get responsible. You might just start with that core. You might not have that garage. You might not have the appendages. You might not have the patios and all the cool party places. And you evolve because the building is ready, prepared to do it. The transportation system that is usually a money sink becomes a money maker because you are generating back into the grid. Food is fairly close to transportation. Does food take any part of the solar decathlon? Nope. Did we do it because there's an internal responsibility as a state university to include it? Because it's that far up on that series of bar charts and then there's energy? This is an energy competition, folks. Isn't it interesting that the health of the occupants and the amount of money per month going into health care and doctors and this, that, and the other thing is almost up to energy? And that the indoor environment becomes really crucial, as does the energy way of thinking about the energy system? So it's interesting the amount of waste out there. Everybody knows what that is. There is a lot of waste. Do you know how much of the total flow of waste is actually reused as a country? About 6%. I understand my old student, Harry Egging, who teaches here, is actually getting into a major reuse studio on that. It's unbelievable. Trashed. You know why they were trashed, by the way? 
such serious indoor air quality in every single one of these, they can't be used. What's the only thing left? The chassis, the axles. So we looked at it, began to figure out ways to dissect these things. They're on wheels. We could pile them up on each other, as you see in the middle top, bring them in, hundreds of them, put them in one end of our production facility, dissect the thing, make all the major components for all the fat walls and the chassis and this, that, and the other thing and come out the other end with the building system. Even beginning to look at the tires and the hubs and the connection to those because they're so strong as being something that is worth valuing from a foundation standpoint. So Texas A&M had me. They produced this facility. They put a million bucks in. Honey, you can go and spec out what you want. I said, really? You got me. I'll drive that 100 miles. Before I knew the police were going to be after me every other day that I did this. There are the fat walls, all being produced independently. Teams doing this, teams doing that. And getting into serious manufacturing of things. There we were taking the control panel fat wall and beginning to mimic what's going on in the area of computers. Computers has this box. Everything inside it has all the protocols that you've ever dreamt of because everybody has to communicate with each other and all the plugins and all the things, they got to work. So we have these unbelievable models that have never really been brought into the building industry. Safety, weight, human scale, no question about it. You've got to have it together. You're doing it when you come in the middle of the night. You don't have even enough light and sensible stuff going on around you and everybody's dead tired. And out the other end, you produce something that is really attractive begins to connect to lots of the resources in Texas and our part of the world, represents again a fractal of place, both the reuse and version and all mixed together, and then going out a little bit of a limb. I sort of say, you know, Washington, D.C., isn't it interesting that the wind, when it comes up to that edge of the building, top corner, speeds up. So here's this wonderful wind system that actually peaks over the edge. Was it important for our building to do this? No importance. Was it important for actually that as a model for large buildings and urban areas? Perhaps. All the woods we could track, all the metals we could track, fat walls and everything, and you know the students came along and they got all these incredible donations. And they got donations for a refrigerator, Sub-Zero, and a stove by Wolf, and all these things that were absolute fortunes. And I said, you know, there's no way. The, the energy efficiency isn't very good. This is not a model for the kind of people that we're trying to design this for. And they said, Prof, cool it. We got the donations. Sorry. Guess what won the, <coughs> the appliance award in the solar decathlon versus the Germans, 
other Europeans that had millions of dollars behind their homes is this one. You know why? Nothing fails. Because everything is being monitored. And even though there was a little bit more energy being used, and a little of this and a little of that, that was the only kitchen that did not fail. So it's sort of a very interesting combination of things that you run into because failure here loses. Within days, you've lost. And then you sort of poke fun at things. You sort of put that middle wall in there, and the upper, I'm sorry, the middle floor is leather. Animal rights people come into the building and they say, a leather floor. The Texans are a little bit worse than I thought. You put leather on the floor. I say, yeah, there's a hell of a lot of leather in Texas. We have so much leather, we don't know what to do with it. Oh, it's not going to hold up. 400,000 people later, the floor is perfect. So it's very important also, because right now nobody believed in you. You're now in debt, $300,000. The department doesn't look me straight in the face anymore. So what do you do? You make a really attractive alumni deck. And you have an outrageous party. And you raise the funds. The building next to us, by the way, 1.4 million. Spain. The building two buildings down, Germans. 2.4 million. This is 800 square foot building. So finally we took the German students out and they drink a lot of beer, but we got enough beer in them to find out what, what's going on. Who did the building? You did the building? Or did industry do the building? Or how much came in from your government to do this? And they said to us, what does it matter? <clears throat> we take this stuff seriously. We're going back and getting into the business of doing this stuff. Can you imagine how much a car prototype costs? Three million dollars ain't nothing. Does the housing industry even approach taking this stuff seriously enough that they'll put the money into a prototype and then by the way, sir, we always win. And then the Bat Tower. Here is the one of the two most funded universities in the country related to pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizer research. So I just could not resist the typical yard of the United States because of the chemicals that are put in between the chemical fertilizers, the pesticides, the herbicides. You have a toxic soup that has 34 carcinogens in many yards across the country, much worse than what we're doing in agriculture. So wouldn't it be interesting to get a living machine going that could get rid of the insects, create the guano, collect it, and put it into that garden that sits right behind it that is organic guano-fed garden. What was really cool is that there were more people interested and the living machine and the garden than any of these solar systems. They would line up figuring out how you do this. What is this about? Man, we would love to have that in our yard. 
all this other stuff is too bloody expensive. And then here at the end of the garden, the guano garden, is this beautifully done, color-coded way of tracking everything that we were about in that building. And sure enough, one failure after another failure within a day and a half. And we had to track it. So the visualization and the connection to how things work became absolutely crucial for us to even get through the competition in, within the first two days. Then it became also very interdisciplinary. We had landscape architecture, we had architecture, we had construction science, we had some planners involved, all having to communicate together because guess what? There is a deadline and something either works or it doesn't work and there is no grading. You either make it or you don't and you're on an international scene. You've got countries competing with each other. You are representing your university in a big way. You're going to get tremendous publicity if you do well, and particularly if you do badly. So we have various tools. I'm not going to go all over all of them. This is a tool to begin to understand how do you make a prototype. You go from world to site. You look at patterns of things. You look at the space that you're in. Are there spaces that are connecting to other places in the world that are similar to yours? You're producing sites that do the same. You're getting very conscious of the fact that certain things like this is happening. Water stress, stress worldwide. The amounts of areas of the world that are becoming so stressed that they have to produce their own water. You begin to get what we call proto-partners, people that are out there that actually can connect to the same place that you can learn from. So you're beginning to get peers within similar conditions back and forth. So that if you discover something, you know where you should share it because you know what's going to happen? You share and something comes back. So here's a different situation that grew out of the fact that I was on CNN International and I got an unbelievable amount of feedback. This is a very Weird slide, isn't it? Sorry about that. And the feedback was two solid pages, single space, from all over the world. Because it went in 200 countries, and there were only four of us chosen worldwide to do this show on how environmental systems can become an understanding in the technology of the future. Can't remember the name exactly of the program, but it was more or less that. So I go down this list and I say, I'm not going to get back to all these people. There's no way. I don't have the staff. I don't have the time. So I go down the list and I say, whoa, Morocco. That sounds cool. I'll call those guys back. Always wanted to go to Morocco. As a matter of fact, from what I know in Protoscope, there's a lot of similarity between Texas and Morocco. And once I get there, sure enough, I can practically take my camera and keep clicking as we tour the countryside, caliche pit after caliche pit after caliche pit, and yet they're burning and firing and making their brick and polluting. And I can take that caliche with very little effort and pass unified building code one thing after another thing after another thing. So the protoscope and the proto partners were all beginning to work. But then they said, hey, you know, 
We love what you're talking about. Every time you open your mouth, it seems as though there's a solution coming up. Why don't you propose a way of bioremediating our surface mining of phosphate mining? So here these guys are phosphate suppliers for 45% of the world's phosphate. So we met in this Rockefeller-type long table with all these scientists and all these industrialists saying, what are these guys saying? And they loved it even more. So they said, you know, can you propose a city that includes all this stuff? And I said, come on, it's a little bit of a task, isn't it? Well, you seem to be so quick in your feet, shouldn't be that much of a problem, should it? Yeah, right. So I had to, they gave me five weeks to present something in D.C. to the International Development Bank, to the World Bank, to a bunch of possible funders, to industrialists. And so I did a ridiculous thing. I asked them one question. I said, I understand that you guys are proposing a heliostat system, in fact, five of them, to generate enough power to send electricity to Europe. He said, yep, one's underway. Cool. Where are the sites? So one site was so close to one of these totally scarped, scraped, manhandled for hundreds of square miles of scarred earth. I said, great, can we take one of those pits and use the idea of the solar heliostat system as the core for a community of the future? And they said, well, sir, we don't know what you're talking about, but sure, go ahead. So it eases your mind that that is the way to start, so I did very sophisticated thing. I looked at all the round cities, historically. I looked at all the heliostats and what they were doing. I looked at the future eco-cities and what they weren't doing. And I came up with a proposal. I also used protoscope and began to understand what was going on in the world in similar places. My learning network, because I had to learn quickly. Great experiment. No money, but we'd love to see what you could do because we'd like you to present to the king. Cool. I'm with it. Fast thinking. So I looked at a number of situations that I knew about in similar conditions. And one of these things <coughs> was the fact <coughs> that they were in a zone that I showed you a moment ago, actually, that had saline groundwater inundation into one-third to one-half the country. And that agriculture was not going to continue unless they could treat that water. In fact, they couldn't even use it in Portland cement. So if I you go to some places in the world, you're mixing bad water with the cement and everything fails. So I said, we would like to possibly use a different way of thinking about cement. And that cement comes out of the brine, which is the byproduct of pumping the salt water to make it pure water. They said, sure, we don't know what you're talking about, but I began to show them some slides. 4,000 platforms, 34,000 miles of pipeline. And what is it doing? It's bringing in petroleum and brine water. And the first thing that happens on the shore, they separate the brine water from the petroleum, they take the brine water and they put a lot of it back into the bay. Or they pump it underground and they frack with it. So we did a little bit of analysis. And we began to find that between this and this, which are the cities having to treat their water, 
that we had 110% of all the cement in Texas already there. All we had to do is collect it and fire it at one-third the energy and temperature as Portland cement. So they became enamored. The other thing I did is that I got as familiar as I could quickly. This is not easy to do quickly, but the beauty of this culture, the unbelievable design patterns. How could I ever absorb this enough so that when anything that we're doing actually began to reflect this kind of thing? So we had partners over there, and we had all kinds of information exchanged very quickly to come up with something that actually could represent things. This is what we were fighting. This is called surface mining. So these things are so large and so destructive that I began to look at a map of the world of where this is about to happen. And if this continues to happen, planet Earth <coughs> is going to begin to look like the moon. And these things rapid fire. It's a little bit ridiculous. But these are some of the things going on in the world at this magnitude and power and money because agriculture worldwide depends on these machines. They mine phosphate. So, We propose some fairly outrageous things. And we believe in doing this because you need images of the future. The future has got to be not only reparative, but really interesting, exciting. The future cannot go back to this humdrum situation that we're just going to solve problems, because people are not going to get excited about solving problems. They're going to look at the next stage. So this entire city, as I went over it with some very, very good chemists, engineers, for new cements, began to verify, you know, this could be done. And some of the things that I have out on the table here, like basalt fiber, we did our little maps, and I'm, this is a big presentation, and I'm short-circuiting short it a lot. We found basalt within 25 miles of the site in the Atlas Mountains. In fact, we are so amazed that here there is a fiber that can be made to reinforce this cement that is not metallic, that will last forever, that you're beginning to upgrade the entire idea of how buildings could happen. So the tall towers were a little bit outrageous. I'm having a little bit difficult time getting this built, but we'll just play along with this at the moment. The top of the tower, the tall towers, is a hydrogen-operated spherical blimp borrowed from the Forest Service. Because the Forest Service can take these things and they, you, you, they look at them as blimp pickups. They can take a lot of the probably illegally cut wood off of slopes that no one can get to because they can't get those long drag lines to that slope. So they've developed this very nimble way of operating that they can go very slowly, almost like a helicopter, pick unbelievable weights up and maneuver, dump, 
maneuvered, dumped. They said, wow. You know, we could begin to scenario-wise put together surfaces on this that are unlike the old blimps. So we had a lot of fun together beginning to look at a future that was a really bright way of thinking about a future. Now, the thing that did not go over too well is the fact that what you see, and I don't have any light thing up here, is that those long ribs going up those tall towers or for gravity transportation. So I had a physicist on the team. You bring the small automobiles to the top and then let them go. The problem is the point of deflection. And I don't have to tell you where that is. Are you going to make it through that point? And so the city is being trying to be develop around the idea of gravity transportation. So there's physics involved, chemistry involved, water processing involved. And the, t and the city began to use these tents, whoops, to follow the mine and use some of that basalt and use some of that fabric to make permanent, long-lasting tents. And in the middle, what was holding it up? The tower that had the heliostat point at the top that would produce the electricity, and all around it are the mirrors. So that point. These are the transportation hubs and the, and the shade systems for the agriculture. So this is this crazy tower. That's the point I was talking about, whether people would actually make it or not. But it is an interesting situation because what's real and what isn't real? How can you develop scenarios that actually represent a whole lot of things that we're talking about all the way to the point of having buildings that utilize these materials? And then going and figuring it all out. So this is the bioremediation of the land. That's the map on the upper right of the world that's about to be put into surface mining. These are the kind of color systems that we are looking at as being part of the tent <clears throat> to change wavelengths, if we wished, for some of the agriculture that would be vertical, roof, all kinds of things to produce at very high rates. Whether people would want to connect to this would be an interesting issue. But we also began to get feedback systems going, the personal level, neighborhood level, and all the way on up so that you're beginning to say there might be a way of rewarding for completion of cycles. Behaviorally, as an individual, every day, the next scale and next scale, until the point that you're producing more than you need. Going and looking at the eco-balance in every part of how the community and the city was put together. is done for energy, materials, food, water, flexible systems for building. All the eco-balance stuff that I was showing today earlier. Where was it balanced? How is it partnered? To what degree does balance happen? Inside, outside, what's the boundary? How do you get net export and beginning to get a vocabulary going that you can nimbly begin to assess how you're doing things as you go. 
understanding regions and both how people think about regions and how nature thinks about regions. Looking at how information organization works and currency and energy and materials. Working at one end of the spectrum and the other end of the spectrum. Admitting that the entire spectrum is worthy of working with. Having processes, admitted techniques, step by step. How do you do the planning? How do you do the balancing? Is it totally different? No. Is it borrow lots of things that we've been doing in the past, but interpreted in a better way, in a more relevant way? John put a lot of this in his book that I was very thankful that somebody actually had the guts in an academic environment to put a book together for the future of landscape architecture and said, this might be the way. Does it borrow from lots of associative things that we're very connected to? Permaculture, things that we all know about, but we have to bring it in a little bit more to our vocabulary of things. So that we're accepting, sort of edgy, on the unacademic, unprofessional, connective sphere of things and begin to accept them because you have a language to do it. So I'm not going to go too much into Indiana, and we have to sort of stop this pretty soon, but it is very, very interesting to me about how many of the things that we're talking about go on here. The same situations, on and on and on. Is the coal good? Is the coal bad? Is the byproduct of the coal something that should be used, being used? Is the coal best to be burned? Where are the gas fields? Where are they pumping? What are they pumping? This is some of your saline stuff going on. You're not even on a coast. This is major. 60,000 to 90,000 parts per million. That's about as extreme as a lot of coastal areas that I've been in where I'd, ex I'd expect this. So I'm going to probably end here, but I'm going to say one more thing, particularly for those of you who design buildings. There are so many really important protocols that we just tap into one or the other and think that we're doing what we need to be doing. And what we realize in understanding this whole way of understanding the supports and the connections that we're about, there's a whole way of thinking about designing for disassembly. All the protocols necessary to do that. Design for open building, design for manufacturing, design for reuse. This is not part, those things there are not part of any curriculum in any program that I know of anywhere that I've ever lectured in. So is one, oh cool, we've done that one. And yet there's an entire set of these things that could launch how we build and think about building to a totally next level. And we can get detail. What exactly is the strategy? What are the steps? But this is whole curriculum. This is whole four year period of really getting into the nitty gritty of how things need to be done. So these diagrams are done for every single one of what I just showed you. But I'm just popping up with one. The mapping needs to be automatic. 
the farm way of thinking about integrating farms has to be automatic. You can't think of farming of the future in a linear, old way. These are vastly increased integrations, simple building that farmers can relate to, fast building, roofs done on the ground. Those are Persian wind towers built right into the way the roof is done. Understanding all the integration potentials. What is this? Is this permaculture? Is this Zero Energy Research Institute? How do I know about this? Because I really love to connect and understand this kind of way of thinking. Is it a flexible farm? Totally flexible. Has it changed already in 20 years? Major change. Now the Rio Grande Study Center. The Department of Agriculture at the state level with a guy by the name of Perry that took over, dumped the farm. The community took the farm and made something much more relevant. A way of understanding the ecology of the most polluted river, <coughs> frankly, in that entire part of the country, called the Rio Grande. So they have all the nature exhibits of the Rio Grande taking the place of what I originally had thought would be a really good integrated farm. So within 20 years, the entire facility changed to something else. A model, a, proto <clears throat> a prototype, because why? That's Mexico over there. What are those gringos doing? They're putting wind systems in the Rio Grande to pump water. They're treating the water with a wetland before it goes onto the organic crops. They're building out of buffalo grass because it's invasive species, and they're actually sequestering it into the building. Wow. And it wins all kinds of design awards, and it's been printed all over the world and published all over the world. Those guys must know what they're doing. So every time that these things come up, design, the technology, the design sciences are all working together with the ecology. No difference. So I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. <laughs> no questions in, the, in this group. Answered all your questions, right? I think I exhausted everybody. I gave them too much information again. Yeah. Uh, somewhere in the presentation, you were talking about uh, building incrementally or building over time. Uh, what kinds of experiences have you had in terms of alternative financing strategies that allow, whether it's to incorporate the greening dimensions of a building into financial mechanisms uh, or the incremental building of buildings to occur over time, uh, the, the funding mechanisms in uh, our our country and uh, with uh, banks and lending agencies tend not to give very many opportunities to do innovative kinds of things. Well, really heavy duty question, and I only have part answers. 
So in our part of the world, the financing community will build anything as long as the engineering community and the architecture community stamp it. Because liability is understood. That said, everything that we do, however experimental it is, we have tremendous backup. This is not P. Fisk out there doing wild things. This is P. Fisk with a lot of the best people that I can get that are respected. So when the financial institutions come along, they say, let's go. Now, as to alternative financing, I would love to say that that's been going on. But there are at least two or three banks in Austin that will finance green buildings, no question. What is sort of more interesting to us, in some ways, is the fact that businesses have taken off on some of these things with traditional financing. So as I mentioned to a few of you before, at the open house, on a number of occasions, people have come up and said, we started. We have a business doing such and such. So the shade systems that we started doing related to the farm in Laredo has spawned a lot of business. The only problem is that we as a nonprofit have a serious situation. We do not learn how to make money off of the fact that we came up with some of these things. It's quite extraordinary until I begin to make the excuse that, you know, the only reason we get funded is that we have created such successful viruses that nobody even knows that we were behind it. And foundations love this. Foundations say, you know, we ran into somebody in Minnesota doing integrated farm stuff that is so similar to what you're doing here that we asked them, did you ever hear of the advanced farming system being done in Texas? And they said, oh yeah, that was published in some magazine and we just we didn't want to call them up. We just wanted to start. But what's sort of happening is a sort of similar thing to what Paul Hawkins has put into the blessed unrest. So this, this great book called The Blessed Unrest. And The Blessed Unrest say there are all these poor little nonprofits out there doing all their good stuff. They first of all don't communicate with each other. And what's also very serious is that because they don't communicate with each other and they do not connect to normal financing channels, they're on a hair's breadth of survival at all times. And the blessed unrest basically says one simple thing. If we got our shit together, we could actually change a lot of stuff out there. So we have a really good fundraiser that we've hired. And we're now beginning to cross over as much as we can. And by the way, we have the best patent attorneys in our part of the world that are pro bono. They ask immediately if this doesn't have a market and you can't talk in sensible terms about a market, folks, we can patent anything. The most important thing is that are you thinking about the market?
But what's very important to us at this moment in time, and now we're the oldest in the country. So we're older than RMI, we're older than the New Alchemy Institute that doesn't exist anymore, the Farallones Institute. So we're very consciously trying to get to that next step. So as I said to some of you earlier on, I'm part of four profit-making organizations. There is an agreement with our <coughs> board of directors that says, you know, this stuff's cute. You get a lot of lectures, you get a lot of commotion going on out there. Where's the money? So they gave us permission to go and license and to get things in shape to say, you know, if you actually start affecting the business community, we're with you. We'll sign agreements. This is fantastic. And, you know, it's sort of a tug back and forth. You know, at some days it says, you know, if you're a good nonprofit, you're putting everything into the public sector. But if you're a good business, you're taking certain things that you are doing and beginning to show how they can make money. So who are we talking to business-wise? I hate to tell you, it's a very difficult thing for me to admit and I usually don't even tell people unless they give me at least a whiskey sour or a, what are we gonna have tonight? I'll make believe I had one. BASF? largest chemical company in the world, Lafarge, the second largest cement company, major energy players, because I came up with this very simple realization and put it all down, sent it to the patent attorney, said we can't find anything going on in that field that you have claimed in 14 different claims and all what it's about is so simple that it's just unbelievable to me. And that is that those mirrors, that those high temperature heliostat systems, if you integrate it into a city and it becomes the fabric of the city, and the shades over the buildings, and the shades over the agriculture, and that I can actually do very important things. I can get them flipped over to protect the mirror from sand, from windstorms. I use a mylar instead of hard surface mirrors. I have them on rolls, I tension them. The roll goes so far that I can actually change the surface to the sun. I can change the color that comes through them on those days that aren't good for perfect sunlight to go to that heliostat because you need perfect sunlight. And as you might imagine, 20 to 30% of the time, no perfect sunlight. And then the issue is, what happens at night? These things do anything at night? So we developed a way of cleaning the mirrors, re-radiating from the fluid, chilling the fluid as it's cleaning, recycling it, going through a heat exchanger, using the cool temperatures from the desert night sky into cooling the things that are underneath it. One more, can't, for, can't quite remember it as long, but, but go ahead, ask a question. Yep. And I'm curious if you, as you look around, 
the country and speak at different places. Is there any hope for that to happen in existing institutions, or do we have to break it down and go out and form somewhere else like you have and create that from start? Can you transition a place into an integrated that looks at the world the way it's really going to be in the future, as opposed to discipline-based the way we're set up? Well, my view of that is there used to be what was called community design centers. There's very few compared to what it used to be. But I believe that what goes on in a lot of community design centers is not necessarily at all cutting edge. They're into getting the government and the state grants to do affordable housing exactly the way affordable housing has been done for the last hundred years. So I believe somehow there's got to be an innovation incubator way of operating that is very much like what is going on in Holland. And the place that I got my ideas of protoscope from was a group that was associated with the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture and Industrial Design that burned to the ground. I can't remember the name of the school at the uh, Delft. So Delft burned to the ground. So it's very interesting when your university, I mean, just imagine if this place burned to the ground. What would you do? That is mean. Did you hear that? <laughs> but what it begins to make you do is it makes you reevaluate everything. Slides are gone, libraries are gone. What are you going to do? So I gave my talk. We were all invited from all over the world. What do you do? And so the president of the student body came up to me and sort of <clears throat> whispered in my ear. She said, there's only one thing worth saving. I said, but everything's gone. And so she said, well, it was an idea. And it was put together by a wild person by the name of Winnie Moss. And Winnie Moss was is part of a think tank operation that is one of the only architecture think tanks that I know of. MVRDV, that's private sector. There used to be others, such as the Institute for Lightweight Structures in Stuttgart, but this is of the moment today. And she said, you know, I produced a neutral ground. Not university run, not industry run, not necessarily even community run. It's a neutral space. And anybody can come along with what they think is the most important thing for that community to solve. And they somehow have collected the resources together that no matter where the issues roam to, that we can get the expertise together to solve the problem. But was... <clears throat> <clears throat> Talk too much today. What was very cool about it is that, first of all, this was a student that came up to me. This is not a faculty person saying, hey, there was this great thing going on. Forgot to tell you. There's a student. And it was the most incredible thing that I found and learned. And I said, you know, that is the basis of prototyping the future from neutral ground. Now, how you actually put this together, don't know. And they have not quite gotten it together enough because they've had to put a school together to come back to that idea that Winnie Moss and everybody knows who MVRDV is. Interesting group. 
So that's as close as I can come to sort of answering your question. And I know that John, for example, is trying to produce a nonprofit that is associated with the university. Yeah. There's a reception after this? <laughs> You're kidding. Do we have time for another? Better be a good one, John. Um, as someone who's innovated and prototyped on your center property and prototyped on university campuses, um, and knowing other people that have done that, that have done, been able to do really innovative stuff in the classroom, but when it comes to physically building things at universities, like uh, uh, John uh, Lyle. Lyle, yeah, like John Lyle, the Center for Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly. Can you talk just a little bit about how difficult it is <coughs> to actually do innovative, high-risk kinds of projects if you're associated with a university? Oh, if you're associated with a university? Well, I think in either case, whether it happens to be with a university or it's a nonprofit, the thing that is most difficult for us to weather and figure out next steps is are we creating enough of a framework that others can pick up on us of a younger generation and keep it going? So we are very, very interested, and this is going on at our place at this very moment, in young people that are sold on the possibility of creating a similar nonprofit institute. Because usually what happens to us in the past, people use us as a stepping stone to go to their masters or PhD levels. The letter that we give, schools know who we are. Offices that you can get into, but never can we create <clears throat> a similar organization and learn from you to do that. It's now happening. So we're partnering with young Turks, and these people are totally unlikely people. I mean, here's this kid that is this blonde-haired weightlifter. You never know. The guy heard one talk at a conference that I gave, a uh, talk at a conference. He left the conference. He came to our place immediately. Said, I am trying to do this. Can I become an intern? So he brought his friend with him. And friend is all of about five foot two female, fiery, and she says, I want to join too. And I said, well, you don't articulate, look as though you have construction skills. And she said, pardon me? <clears throat> and so she said, you know, I'm licensed in forklifts warehouse. I have my OSHA certificate. What are you talking about? Do you have anybody here that does that? I weld. I'm here for another reason, by the way. I'm seeing you, and then I'm going down, and I have another appointment. And so that's cool. So there, we have competition. 
Oh, no, you don't have any competition. So, mind me asking where you're going? And she says, Austin, Texas, has some of the best belly dancing teachers in the USA. And I am going to meet with my teacher to tell her that I'm coming. So we're walking out. And she says, also, by the way, if you don't think I have any strength at my small stature, I'm the New York State 105-pound weightlifting champion. So what you have to be prepared for is a new generation that has multiple interests, that also their heart is actually in this direction. And what they're telling us, they could not find places out there that were as wide in scope as what we're involved in, that they could really sincerely learn how to do this themselves. So for the first time, <clears throat> the other day, we had them present to our board of directors. And they showed the plan. How we're going to get together, where we're going to get funding, how we're going to partner, this, that, and the other thing. So John and I could keep going all night long in this, but we're going to sort of, I'm going to stop it. Okay. <laughs> so um, let me just, let me just make a couple of closing. First of all, I'd like to thank the Department of Landscape Architecture, uh, the wow. faculty, and the students for helping to bring this together. And certainly we're going to carry on, and in particular, John Motlock for managing to pull all of this together. Uh, I've heard that there is a small reception somewhere that way. I'm not sure if they've just given up on us and closed down, but if not, there are a few uh, <coughs> snacks to end the day with, and Cindy will be there for a few more minutes if you have any more questions. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much for listening to all this craziness. Yeah. I appreciate it.